Do you ever wonder how we will be remembered in history? I don't mean you as an individual, but rather the times we're living in. It's fun to think about, but ultimately, it is impossible to understand how future generations will view our era. You never know where events unfolding around us will lead. What seems significant to us today might just peter out and end up in a historical cul-de-sac, while small, seemingly irrelevant events are in fact the start of much bigger trends. 2013 was a good example of this. It was forgettable in most respects. There were few standout events that year. To be honest, looking back, I got nostalgic. Given what the last decade has thrown at us, an uneventful year seems like a much better time. But the lack of major events in 2013 is only part of the story of that year. While it wasn't dominated by headline-grabbing stories, change was nevertheless afoot. Behind the headlines, history was in the making. The internet was starting to transform everyday life. In the last episode, I said you might not be a revolutionary, but you are living through a revolution, and in 2013, this online revolution was really starting to heat up. Smartphones were revolutionising the way we lived our lives. An old world, an old way of doing things was starting to slip away. This could be seen in subtle ways in everyday activities. It was particularly making its presence felt in places like waiting rooms and public transport. Where once we read newspapers or books, we increasingly entertained ourselves on smartphones. Wi-Fi access was becoming more important than television when booking hotel rooms. But these small changes symbolised a massive shift that was underway in society. Smartphones had first appeared in 2007, but it was only in the early 2010s that prices began to drop, and around 2013, they really started to take off. In 2014, global annual sales of smartphones surpassed 1 billion for the first time. By mid-2014, 57% of all mobile phones in Ireland were smart devices. Internet usage began to surge. A survey of 15 to 35 year olds in 2014 suggested over 41% of people were spending two to four hours a day online on our phones. Another 26% of us were spending more than four hours online on our phones by 2014. As everything started to change, there were winners and losers in this brave new online world. Traditional media like books and newspapers were struggling to adapt. HMV, one of the most famous music retailers, had gone into receivership in 2013 because everyone was downloading their tunes now. Podcasting, however, was one of the big winners. By 2014, it was already a decade old. But as we heard in the last episode, the first age of podcasting had faltered around 2007 to 2008. It wasn't that it had disappeared completely, but people were talking about it less and what had been a surge of new podcasts had stalled somewhat. If you searched for podcasts around this time, a lot of the content you would have found was just rehashed radio shows. Podcasting, in many ways, had come too early. In the absence of smartphones, podcasts were awkward to download and this had proved a major obstacle, preventing it becoming mainstream. Fast forward a decade to 2014 and the proliferation of smartphones streamlined the download process. The following decade would see an explosion of podcasting, not only in terms of listenership but also content creation. Now this can't be explained by the smartphone alone though. While they may have made it easier to listen to a podcast, there had to be something to listen to. And around 2014 there were groundbreaking developments on this front. In 2014, a new show launched that adapted one of the oldest forms of entertainment known to humans, storytelling, and turned it into a podcast sensation. This show, Serial, was the equivalent of a gateway drug for many, maybe yourself included. It was the first podcast that you tried and it got you hooked. Now, if you Google podcasting or the history of podcasting today, Serial will be one of the first things mentioned, so it's a crucial stopping point on our journey through the history of podcasting. After looking at its impact, we'll continue on with the story, bringing it right up to the present day.
You're going to hear more from Brian Green, who has been podcasting in Ireland for nearly 20 years, and then show hosts like Blind Boy, Sinead, the host of Mens Rea, and Sam Bungie and Jennifer Ford, who made West Cork. And before we set off, I should introduce myself. My name is Finn Dwyer. This is the Irish History Podcast, and you're listening to Let Me Tell You a Story, a history of podcasting, part two. If you haven't heard part one, do check that out first. You'll enjoy this episode way more if you listen to that first. When I sat down to write about cereal, I wasn't sure whether I even needed to explain what it was, given it's arguably the most famous podcast of all time. However, it's nearly 10 years old now, so I'm guessing there are growing numbers of people who haven't heard us, or maybe even haven't heard of us. I also think the impact of the show has been distorted over the last decade. So the backstory of Serial is that in the early 2010s, Sarah Koenig, a journalist working on the show This American Life, began investigating the 1999 murder of a woman called Heyman Lee. A man, Adnan Saeed, had been tried, convicted and sentenced to prison for the crime. He protested his innocence and Koenig's investigation re-looked at the case in detail. In that summary, I have made what is a gripping story into something very dull, but we do have another story to tell. As Koenig's investigation was developing, it was decided that rather than release it as a single episode of This American Life, the case would become a standalone series called Serial. Now, Serial would refine the art of storytelling in podcast format. Rather than just to tell the story of her findings, Koenig included her own investigation as part of the narrative. The series is compelling in so many ways. It's open-ended. When it was released, it couldn't be ruined in the way the internet ruins everything these days because you couldn't find spoilers online. No one really knew what Koenig would reveal next. It was unfolding in real time. The writing and structure was also brilliant. When you listen, you feel like you're there with Koenig as she is unravelling the case. Now, the impact Serial had when it was released was phenomenal. It dropped in October 2014 and it took the podcasting world by storm. But far more significantly, it did something other podcasts up to this point hadn't really done. It took the wider world by storm as well. Famous hosts like Mark Maron and Joe Rogan were well established by this point, but they didn't attract the commentary or have the influence at this critical juncture that Sarah Koenig and her team did. Because when Serial dropped, even legacy media outlets like newspapers and TV started discussing it and reviewing it, much like they would a film or a book. That was really unusual for a podcast back then. It felt like everyone was talking about Serial in late 2014 and into 2015. Brian Green, who had been making podcasts nearly a decade by 2014, reflected on this when we spoke when something is so good that word of mouth will do its advertising, it travels fast and far. You couldn't buy this type of endorsement that Serial was getting. It was friends telling other friends to listen to it, people they trusted. And as an introduction to podcasting, it couldn't be better. After Serial, people wanted to hear more podcasts. Sinead, the host of Mens Rea, described the impact this show had on her. I had no real conception of podcasts until I heard Serial, like everybody else. I had been addicted to talk radio. I was an avid news talk listener. And one of the morning show people had mentioned Serial. And then I listened to it. And then I listened to every single thing that mentioned crime or Adnan Syed in it (laughs) on the podcast player. I eventually ran out of like Serial-based podcasts and moved on to other crime podcasts. So in 2014, Serial helped refocus attention on podcasting that had been in a bit of a wilderness since around 2008. People who never listened started to tune in. This was, after all, content that was only available as a podcast. The show quickly broke all records. Within weeks, it had been downloaded 5 million times, which was huge back then. It still is today. 2015 would see Sarah Koenig named as one of the 100 most influential people of that year. But what was perhaps equally significant is that Serial set what has been a gold standard of storytelling that has shaped the last nine years of podcasting in a major way. You'll hear echoes of Serial across all genres right up to the present. 
Even The Onion released a parody podcast based on Serial. It's really excellent. I'll link that in the show notes below. Now, what Serial achieved was clearly huge, but sometimes I think it's framed in the wrong way. That kind of distorts the wider history of podcasting. Like, you'll read articles that claim it kickstarted podcasting. We heard last week that that's clearly not the case. Podcasting had been around a decade by the time Serial came out. Another article I read on NPR claimed it spawned a cottage industry of true crime podcasts. A lot of this type of commentary implies that Serial was a starting point in a genre of podcasts structured around storytelling that has driven the growth of the industry over the last decade. But I think it's probably more accurate to say that Serial as a show helped move this storytelling format from radio to podcasting and exploited it to its full potential in podcast format. In terms of understanding the history of podcasting, radio therefore is really important as it laid the foundations for what has been some of the most popular type of shows. We can even see this in the history and DNA of Serial itself. Serial was, after all, a spin-off of This American Life. While it might be more famous as a podcast today, This American Life is a radio show. It started life as a radio show and, to this day, is first broadcast on radio and only then released as a podcast. This American Life and other radio shows have had a huge impact on podcasting, perhaps most famously through Serial, But even when I spoke to Blind Boy, one of Ireland's most famous podcasters who makes a very different type of show, he brought up some of the key influences on his storytelling technique. These not only included This American Life, but also an earlier generation of radio hosts. There was a radio broadcaster in Los Angeles in the 1980s called Joe Frank. And Joe Frank used to do very surreal monologues, quite similar to what I do. And Joe Frank has always been a huge influence in me. I found him through Chris Morris, who made Brass Eye, because he was an influence on him. And I would listen to hours and hours of Joe Frank. And this influenced how I did my tone of my podcast and the storytelling. And then I found out Joe Frank was the one who trained Ira Glass of This American Life. Yeah, Joe Frank trained Ira Glass. And what he trained him in was, it doesn't matter what you're speaking about, so long as there's a story. And a story is just set up, conflict, resolution. And that's what This American Life does really well. And it's what I learned from This American Life and also from Joe Frank. If you can imbue that in whatever the fuck you're doing and you do it well, then people will listen. That's a story. When a podcast is shit, it's because it doesn't have that. Indeed, the influence of This American Life is hard to overstate. So many creators will refer to it as being a major influence on them. In making this series, I interviewed Jennifer Ford and Sam Bungie, the creators of West Cork. This podcast has echoes of Serial in terms of its structure. Described by Louis Theroux as possibly the best true crime podcast of all time, it focused on the unsolved 1997 murder of the French woman Sophie Tuscan de Plantier in West Cork. While it wouldn't be released until 2018, it was years in the planning and the making. Jennifer explained to me the influence that This American Life had on her and Sam. Sam had actually made a story for the show. And even before Serial was released, he and Jennifer had been thrashing out ideas for an unfolding podcast series along similar lines to Serial. Then when it dropped in 2014, it proved that this format could work. I mean, we both listened to This American Life a lot, obviously. And Sam had, had done that episode, which was great. I don't know if you've listened to it. It's, and Brian Reed, the guy that did s Town, was his producer on it. So it was a really funny story about a killer turkey in Martha's Vineyard. I was doing documentary and we were both kind of obsessed with kind of, you know, documentary series like The Staircase, which I know got repurposed, but the original one is incredible. We were both kind of wondering, could you do something like that in podcasting because it didn't exist, you know, where you would have one story that would go out week by week, which I know is is the serial kind of introduction. And we were thinking about stories like that, but also, also more formulaic documentary TV series where you follow something that is unfolding, not necessarily a retrospective story. 
But anyway, fly on the wall. yeah, fly on the wall type thing. Exactly. Somebody going through an experience and you would stick with them on, on a particular journey. Then Serial came out and kind of proved the concept. And it was literally not, it was, I mean, maybe it had just finished and we thought, well, let's go looking for stories then. And we bought a newspaper and literally like the first newspaper that we bought a Sunday Observer or something and opened it up and there was the story about it was it just coincided with Ian Bailey's high court action. Okay, so I think you're probably getting the point that seminal radio shows like This American Life have had a huge influence over the development of podcasting as we know it today. It influenced and inspired some of the most influential shows out there. And this kind of makes sense. It helps explain why podcasting took off so quickly Over the last decade, podcasters aren't inventing the wheel. We're developing on decades of innovation on radio. Now we can move the story on from 2014, when Serial had unquestionably put podcasting back on the map. It had provided an example of what podcasting could be, and podcast listenership started to grow. But it wasn't the case that podcasting was an overnight success after Serial's release. It was still something only a minority of people tuned in and listened to. What was essential is that the content kept coming. Shows similar to Serial were released year on year, but there was also a diversity of content as well. No matter what your interest was, from around 2015 onwards, you could find a show in your niche. But there was, as I say, also some mass appeal shows as well. Like in 2016, the somewhat bizarre premise for a comedy show encompassed in its title, My Dad Wrote a Porno, came out in England and that had huge success. 2016 also saw Blind Boy release his show for the first time. Now when I chatted to him about what drew him to podcasting, his answer helped understand the growth of podcasting in these years. He gave a different reason for why people were drawn to podcasting and that's creative freedom. And what I loved about podcasting was everything I hated about the process of making TV, everything I really disliked about the process of making mainstream media as such. Just the podcast I recorded yesterday, it was about the history of carrot cake. And I was able to research this in about two days. I was able to put it together and put it out in a short amount of time and I have creative control over it all. If I had gone to RTE or Virgin Media or BBC, and said, I want to make a documentary about carrot cakes. First off, they wouldn't let me. Secondly, the process. So many people would get involved. This is how it would work, and I'm not joking. So I'd go to RTE. I want to make a documentary about carrot cakes. And then RTE would say, okay, we like the sound of this. Write us a script. So that takes two months. Then I submit the script for the carrot cake documentary. Then I get notes back from RTE. We like this carrot cake documentary, okay? It's really good, but we think it's a bit of a strange sell. Is there any chance you could get Brian McFadden to present it with you? So now I'm like, I don't know, lads. You know, a carrot cake documentary and Brian McFadden is there. Okay, let's go for it. Let's do it. Then I go back at the script. More months pass. New notes from RTE. We really love this uh, documentary you're making about carrot cakes and Brian McFadden. Is there any chance you could get rid of the bit about the carrot cake, right? And it's you and Brian McFadden, and the documentary is now about dancing with celebrities, like Dancing with the Stars, and it's live. And then I have to go, okay, and now I'm making something that's completely different to what the initial idea was, and that's the process of making TV. It really is. A lot of people get involved to the point that you forget what your original vision is and then you lose the passion for the project. My podcast is 100% passion. Through the later 2010s, podcasting started to grow rapidly on all fronts. The numbers of listeners grew steadily and consistently year on year. The best data I could find was from the US and it showed that in 2013 there were 32 million monthly listeners to podcasts in the US. But by 2015, this had grown to 46 million, and by 2018, it had increased further to 75 million. Now, while this audience growth was consistent, developing year on year, show production went through the roof in this period. The numbers of people making podcasts was incredible. In 2014, 40,000 new shows were launched that year. 
Four years later, in 2018, this had increased to over 200,000. That's new shows each year. Some of these were limited series that were similar to Serial. Now, these gained huge popularity and helped drive new audience growth. S-Town, another spin-off from This American Life, dropped in 2017, and Sam and Jennifer's West Cork launched in 2018. They're just two examples of this. Most of the new shows, however, commanded much smaller audiences. Indeed, the average podcast audience is actually tiny and is often distorted when people talk about Joe Rogan or Serial and the huge numbers they command. Asking hosts for show stats is like asking a woman her age. It's not the done thing. But the network, Libsyn, release monthly figures based on the thousands of shows they host. And their most recent numbers show just how small a podcast can be. Half of all podcasts released on their network in September, less than 139 times in the following 45 days or so. Only 1% of shows got more than 28,000 downloads in that time period. However, the smaller shows were and are often weekly or bi-weekly, as opposed to the serials of this world that come in a limited number of episodes. And these weekly shows, while they might be rougher and have smaller audiences, provide a lot of the content that has kept people coming back to podcasting and sustained its growth in the late 2010s. Furthermore, regular shows forge very strong personal relationships between creators and their audiences. Now, these bonds are often described as a parasocial relationship, and they have proved really important in terms of developing a strong foundation for podcasting. In our conversation, Blind Boy talked about this. So in 2011, I started listening to your podcast, and here's what I noticed. You were doing a history podcast. You were giving me the information that I needed about the Normans, but something extra was happening that I didn't understand. I would take an hour out of my day to listen to you talk about the Normans. And I'm like, I'm not just getting information from this chap. He feels a bit like a friend. Do you know what I mean? When I would go for my walks and listen to your podcast in 2011, I was like, why am I coming back here? Because I've gotten the information I needed. And I could go to Wikipedia too if I wanted to. I could go to Wikipedia and learn about the Normans. But I'm invested in this Finn character now. And when he's in my ears, it, it... it feels a bit like he's my friend. And that we know now that that's referred to as a parasocial relationship. And parasocial, the parasocial quality of podcast is very important to what a podcast is. Okay, so let's take stock now of how all this fits into the wider history of podcasting. I like timelines. It allows me to keep track of things. And so far, we have covered a lot of ground. So podcasting began to reemerge around 2014. Technology had finally caught up in the form of the smartphone, while journalists and creators were thinking about new ways about how podcasting could be used to its full potential. This saw the creation of Serial, which took the world by storm, introducing new audiences to podcasting. But crucially, the content kept coming, with major shows that were very famous, but thousands more that were less well-known, but often had small yet loyal listenerships. There's one other part of the jigsaw that I've left out so far, but I think is very important in terms of fully appreciating why podcasting took off in the way it did in the later 2010s. In the last episode, I talked about the trend of entertainment becoming more atomized and more individual experience. Now, this had been going on, as I talked about in the last episode, through the late 20th century, as television took hold. But the smartphone took this to new levels. This saw us all develop our own unique entertainment worlds. We have different Instagram and Twitter feeds, different WhatsApp groups. Podcasting naturally fits into this in a way other, more collective forms of entertainment couldn't. It is, as I mentioned last week, an intensely individualistic form of entertainment and it slots neatly into an entertainment landscape that is very much focused on the individual. I think this is important as podcasting was very much an entertainment form of the 2010s. Overall, though, I think it's fair to say that by 2019, podcasting had arrived. You can see this, for example, in advertising revenue figures for that year. According to industry data, it increased from just over $100 million in 2015 to $480 million in 2019. But just as everything in podcasting seemed to be clicking into place, then COVID happened and everything was upended. That's the last chapter in our story. <laughs>
It's only three years ago, but it seems like a lifetime since COVID changed our world. While it had a profound impact on most aspects of life, podcasting was no different. The pandemic left a lot of people with free time on their hands in lockdowns, and podcast audiences began to rise. But the story of how COVID impacted podcasting is not all good, and it's certainly more complicated than just increasing numbers of people tuning in. Because people weren't just listening to podcasts, but a lot of people started making them. A tweet by the Irish actor Nicola Coughlin captured this mood in 2020, when everyone seemed to be podcasting, when she tweeted, I know this time of self-isolation is hard and scary for people, but however bad you are feeling, please, please don't consider starting your own podcast. Straight men under the age of 35 are particularly vulnerable to this and we all need to be vigilant of the dangers. Now, Coughlin's tweet went viral and she got a bit of blowback and later deleted it, but I think she definitely captured the moment. Everyone was making a podcast in 2020. The stats in this are just incredible. So in 2019, there had been 316,000 new shows launched that year. But in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, over 1 million new podcasts were released that year. In 2021, the second year of the pandemic, nearly three quarters of a million new shows came out. Just to clarify, I mean shows, not episodes. While there was a surge in content creation, I think it's fair to say it was a mixed bag in terms of quality. There was a lot of B-list celebs who had nothing else to do, who started making podcasts that were essentially them talking to other B-list celebs. A lot of these shows were awful, and they did little other than reveal to the world that these celebs didn't have much to say. The pandemic, though, had other negative consequences in terms of more serious podcast production. When I talked to Sam Bungie, he highlighted how investigative projects like Serial or his own West Cork required reporters to go out into the field, and this just couldn't happen in the pandemic. The pandemic wasn't good for for kind of limited series style of podcasts because you couldn't go out and meet people, you know, and and that I think like that's sort of the the magic of the of that kind of radio where you you just feel like you're somewhere out you know you can you can hear whatever even the car door closing or whatever it is that's like puts you somewhere in a different world you know and and all the like yeah all the exciting stuff you can do with recording people overall the pandemic created turmoil in podcasting and its long-term impact is still unclear it's definitely not all good the massive surge in show creation and increase in listenership saw podcast platforms misjudge what was happening. Assuming it was a permanent trend, they began to expand their operations rapidly. However, the end of the pandemic changed things and the confidence these new platforms expressed in the industry has since faltered. The last year or so has seen layoffs and from the high of, say, 2021, when podcasting was considered red hot, there's a lot of talk of uncertainty in 2023. It's very difficult to say what's happening for sure, but there's definitely a lot of change taking place. New show production has fallen dramatically. 2022, for example, saw only 220,000 new podcasts launched that year. That's an 80% decline from the height of the pandemic. And it looks like this year, 2023, is going to be even lower again. But it is worth acknowledging that there was inevitably going to be a decline in production after the pandemic. The levels of shows being released during those two years was just unsustainable. But I think it's fair to say few would have anticipated a decline of the magnitude that's taking place at the moment. And it has people a little uncertain as to what exactly is happening. I would say less shows is not necessarily a bad thing. And I've been making podcasts since 2010 and I've seen a lot of trends come and go. And I think what's probably one of the most important things is that you're still listening and that the audience numbers are holding up. If I was looking for more concerning trends, I'd actually go to something that Jennifer Ford brought up in our conversation when she talked about some of the content you find these days. Whereas I think now in the industry, you get a lot of people who are like tech and, you know, their background is Mm. tech and they're tech companies. And they're having a go. Having a go at podcasting or their TV and they see podcasting as like, the kind of thing that we could do first 
in order to maybe get a documentary off the ground. But the documentary is the prize. And if but if you guys could just do this story quickly and cheaply, just to kind of test the ground and create a market, but maybe hold back some of the real juicy stuff for the documentary. So um, it's like there are just loads of different ways that right now out there, it's just not conducive to getting the best out of people's great ideas. So this reminded me what happened back around 2007 to 2008 when radio stations started pushing out loads of repurposed shows as podcasts. And this had the effect of pushing out independent creators. I would fear a similar knock-on effect to what Jennifer has talked about there. Now, we're nearing the end of this history of podcasting, and I'm conscious that earlier on, Blind Boy said a good story would have set up conflict and then resolution, and I don't have a resolution to end this series. This history of podcasting is inevitably going to end on a bit of an uncertain note. There's so much coming down the line of this, from things like AI through to the impact of major platforms like Spotify. It's impossible to predict what the next few years is going to bring. But to finish, I asked Blind Boy, Sinead from Menzrea and Brian Green for their thoughts on the future of podcasting. We'll start with Blind Boy, who had his trademark hot take on where things are going. If you want to know my prediction, and I know this is is going to be crazy, although it's not that crazy, podcasts are a thing because of smartphones, right? That's why podcasts are popular, because everybody has a smartphone. I think the next battle is going to be self-driven electric cars. Within the next 15 years, I think all the apps such as Spotify, like Spotify spent 100 million on Joe Rogan. That's a lot of money. It's like, what do you want here, lads? I think all the apps want to be the ones that are in the cars of the future. And I think within the next 15 years, we're going to we're all going to have electric cars. They're cars that are going to drive themselves. And once that happens, a new entertainment space opens up. And that entertainment space is whatever's happening in your car when it's driving you where you need to be. So that could be visual, it could be audio, I don't know. But that's my hot take prediction of where it's going to go. Sinead focused on the fundamentals of what have been the key to podcasting's success over the last decade. Audio, storytelling, passing on information to to people in a group with a particular interest. Like those, that to me seems like the staple. So there might be loads of frills that come and go over the next five years, but those those things have to have to remain constant. I leave the last word to Brian Green. So I think the future of podcasting is that it's going to fill the space that radio has entertained for a hundred years, and there will be some linear and live transmitted broadcasted radio, but there will be a growing importance to curated topics and genres that have non-linear audiences that kind of gather around, like you'd gather around the fire, but they're going to gather around the story at a time that suits them. And if people learn to know the difference between broadcasting to a group of people who might be driving in a car at the same time and talking to one person with headphones on, they will really land the story well for that listener when it moves into that phase for them. I'd love to hear your take on what you think the future holds for podcasting. You can reach me at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. I think about this a lot, and as I say, I'm not sure at all, but I'd love to hear what you think. And to conclude the series, I have some important thank yous. Firstly, to Brian Green for his interview, and he shared some fascinating research he has done into podcasting. I want to thank Sam Bungie and Jennifer Ford, Blind Boy, Sinead, the host of Men's Rea, And then two people whose interview didn't make it into the final edit. That's DJ Walsh and Owen Tab, the hosts of The Snowcast, a show made here in Waterford. While you didn't hear from DJ and Owen, a lot of what we talked about did shape these two episodes and I'm extremely grateful for their insights. Sound on the series was by Kate Dunlee. Additional narrations are from Therese Murray. My name is Finn Dwyer and this has been the Irish History Podcast. The final show of the year is out next week and it's on the story of the Irish in the American West. Until then, Sloan.